And because at that time, there's also a change made from the Levitical priesthood to the order of Melchizedek, where there was definitely some things that changed in the way that the services, in the way that the, the service to the Lord is done, and just um, the, the changing from Old Testament to New Testament is a significant change. And God wanted to put his stamp on the changes and be like, no, this is from God. This isn't just people coming in and trying to alter and change the word of God and everything else. It was, um, I believe, all those signs and wonders that were given at that time was just putting that full stamp of approval on it. Um, even though we don't need miracles to prove anything, we've got the word of God. We've got the word of truth here that can lead us and guide us, and we should be able to look at the words and understand that this is right and this is true without the miracles. But God still uses the miracles to, to help us to, to get that understand. I mean, when Jesus came on this earth, he could have preached completely. Obviously, he's fulfilling scripture too, but I'm just saying like it could have been sufficient just to just to preach without all the miracles, but God already promised that. He fulfilled that and he is proving he was the son of God through everything that he did. I mean, by by opening up the ears of the deaf, by opening, you know, the, the blind receiving their sight, that was all prophesied. He had to do that. I'm not saying he didn't have to do that. It's the way that God designed it. But the power of the word of God itself anyways is sufficient. This is my point with that. He could have been able to preach all the truth. Um, if God didn't already prophesy, he was going to have those miracles uh, just because the word of God is that powerful. But he proved he was a son of God. He did all those miracles. He showed like, look, this is legit, right? I mean, he's healing people. He's preaching the word of God. He's doing everything that's prophesied is supposed to be done. And then after that, his disciples are going out. He, he gives them the power of the Holy Ghost to do all these special miracles where they're able to, you know, in Acts chapter 2, they're given the ability to speak with tongues that they didn't know beforehand. It wasn't in their knowledge, but the Holy Ghost is just working through them to be able to speak in other languages that they had not known previously, among other gifts as well. Healing people, we see the Apostle Peter and, and John, and they're going out, and you know, and they're able to heal people. The Apostle Paul you know, they, they have these abilities that are special abilities that God had given them. And the confirmation on the work that they're doing ultimately was done by these signs. And when we look at the signs in, in Mark 16, you know, we see casting out devils. We see speaking with new tongues. We see taking up serpents and if they drink any deadly thing. And that last verse, there, verse 18, the taking up serpents and drinking a deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. Both of those are tied together. It's just talking about the safety and the protection that God is going to put on his servants that are, that are serving him and those that, that believe. And it says they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Now, we have a, a, a fake Christianity out there that's in the, the Pentecostal movement that ultimately turns church into a big circus and... They want to say, oh, no, you know, all these things are still happening today. And they have people rolling around on the ground and they have their, their fake healing stories and everything else to deceive people into thinking. that. And what's funny is that because they're so focused on these few verses here, they also have that strong belief that you could lose your salvation or that you need to be baptized in order to be saved. Right? Well, if you're not baptized, then, then you're not saved. And they get that from Mark 16, 16, where it says, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And just real, real quickly, I wasn't even going to go into this, but it's such a simple verse. And when you compare that to every other verse in the Bible that you look to, talking about salvation, you're never going to see that baptism is tied into the requirements for being saved. But what this statement says is 100% true and accurate. Amen. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Well, you know what? I believe and I was baptized. Right. If you were baptized too, you're saved, right? He that believeth is what saves. Right. He that believeth, if you add anything else just describing something that you've done. He that believeth and goes to church shall be saved. You can say that too because it's the believing that saves. It's just breaking it down to that uh, that rudimentary. And also, even just in, containing the same verse, if you had to be baptized to be saved, then why do you say he that believeth not shall be damned? It doesn't say anything about baptism. 
It doesn't say, he that believeth and is not baptized shall be damned. It doesn't say, he that believeth not and is not baptized shall be damned. It says, he that believeth not shall be damned. Right? So, there's nothing wrong with this verse. There's nothing untrue about this verse. It's completely fine if you understand English and if you understand logic and reasoning, how you can have something be true in an equation that even if you add other things on there. Now, look, it, this isn't talking about your faith is in the baptism to be saved. If your faith is in baptism to be saved, then you're not saved. If your faith is in Christ and you happen to be baptized, then you're saved. 